fate of the Black Beret is the fate of all uniforms. I am Chuck the Bureaucrat, and a while back I did a video talking about the Army's transition to having two dress uniforms, one green and one blue. Long story short, about 15 years ago, the Army decided to go from two uniforms to one. And then, with the introduction of the Army Green Service uniform, they went back to two. And of course, that video attracted some comments about the Black Beret, and particularly, what's the deal with the Black Beret, and what's going to happen in the future? And I'll be honest, I don't have any inside secrets about the future of the Black Beret. I mean, the decisions that get made about uniforms can be some of the most arbitrary decisions made in the military. And you never know what kind of crazy ideas unsupervised Pentagon Sergeant Majors are going to cook up while everybody else is fighting over the budget. But the story of berets in the U.S. military, not just black berets, but all berets, they highlight a deep truth about what the real purpose of uniforms are. At the rock bottom, uniforms are about pride, morale, and identity. Uniforms are far less about signaling, I'm just like everybody else, and more about signaling, I am unique and special. In fact, in a second, I'm going to show you how commanders are empowered to leverage uniform policy for that specific purpose. But first, berets. The first documented use of colored berets in the U.S. military dates back to about 1943. At the time, British airborne soldiers were wearing a beret that was a deep red color. And the commander of the British 1st Airborne Corps gave some of those berets as gifts to members of the 509th Parachute Infantry Battalion. It wasn't a big deal, but by 1954, U.S. Special Forces troops were wearing a green beret similar to the one that had been worn by British commandos during World War II. Technically, the green beret was unauthorized. But according to legend, President Kennedy visited the U.S. Army Special Warfare Center and School, and he caught a glimpse of the Commandant wearing his green beret. And so, President Kennedy decided to make it the first authorized beret. Now, let's just stop for a second and consider three themes that hold true for uniforms in general, but had already manifested themselves with the berets. First, unauthorized wear. The slightest deviation from regulation. Well, that could be a big thrill for service members. Oh. And the idea that they have a commander who backs them up on a uniform violation? <laughs> I mean, nothing says you're special like being allowed to break the rules. And what's more, the commander who has the nerve and the influence to support his troops while they flout the rules? Uh, well, that's a commander that the troops are going to love. And let's be honest. The idea of unauthorized wear is more about some irrelevant piece of headgear. It's also about what works. At the beginning of Operation Iraqi Freedom, the, the fleece jacket was being issued as part of the extended cold weather clothing system. But it was not intended for outer wear. At the time, it had no name tapes or ranks on it. But many, many soldiers found it to be an effective garment on a cold desert night. So much so that eventually that unauthorized wear, well, it became authorized. But back to the berets and these post-World War II themes that we can see. The second theme is the role that imitation plays in the adopting of anything that is special. U.S. soldiers were copying respected members of other military services as a way to show that they too were special. And that's the story of how the beret starts to expand into the U.S. Army. In the 1960s, armor and cav forces, well, they unofficially adopt a black beret. In 1973, 82nd Airborne soldiers 
start wearing a maroon beret, again unauthorized. In 1975, the Ranger Battalions are standing up and they officially get the Black Beret. All of that copying and imitation, well, it dilutes the specialness of the beret, just like it would for any piece of uniform that separates the hoi polloi from the real soldiers. And so we come to the third theme about uniforms, which was present back there with President Kennedy and the Green Beret, but it's also going to characterize the, the future of the berets in the 70s and 80s. It's just a piece of cloth. Or along the lines of Napoleon, a soldier will fight long and hard for a piece of ribbon. What I mean is that the amount of cost and effort that a leader has to put into some kind of morale-boosting uniform adjustment, well, it can be pretty minimal compared to the, the benefits that it generates. That's the third theme. Uniform changes are the easy button for the higher-ups. In that mythic story of President Kennedy and the, the first commandant of the Special Forces School, you can choose to believe that President Kennedy was just so overcome with excitement that he couldn't help himself but authorize the Green Beret. But I suspect that the conversation really went something like this. President Kennedy says, just let me know if there's anything I can ever do for you. And the Commandant says, let my men have the beret. And of course, Kennedy would say yes, because it's no skin off anybody's nose, least of all his. And it has a huge impact on the organization's morale. I mean, <laughs> they have a statue commemorating this event. But with this third theme of uniforms, that it's the easy button for leaders, the story of the Black Beret continues to unfold. And that which is easy to authorize is easy to forbid. By 1978, colored berets were cropping up like mushrooms. The Army Chief of Staff put his foot down and said the only authorized beret is the Green Beret for Special Forces. And then the next Chief of Staff brought back the Black Beret for Rangers and the Maroon Beret for Airborne. But from about 1981 on, berets were essentially settled law. But then for the Army's birthday in 2001, General Shinseki, the Chief of Staff of the Army at the time, directed the wear of the Black Beret for virtually all soldiers. It was a massive imitation achieved with the snap of a finger. But what has always mystified me is, what good did it do? I mean, it doesn't seem like he was authorizing something that the rank and file cherished. And this was months before 9-11. So there was no reason for a morale boosting move. And what I always thought was interesting is that most unit commanders, they would boost morale by allowing soldiers not to wear the Black Beret. See, AR 670-1 allows commanders to modify uniforms for ceremonial purposes. Commanders can authorize scarves and cords and awards and civilian badges and quasi-military doodads and almost any piece of OCIE. And even the Black Beret can be replaced by the commander in most, although not all, situations. So what's the future of the Black Beret? Well, it's probably not going to be going away anytime soon. But just like anything that is common to everybody, well, it's also not special. Its value has been too diluted. And maybe if you took it out of circulation for a couple of decades, it could regain its cachet, but that's a long process. I'm not even sure the Rangers would want it back now that a, a generation of leaders has grown up with the tan beret. A more important guide for predicting the future of uniforms is to ask the question, what unauthorized piece of uniform or equipment is cherished by soldiers today? Whether they like it because it imitates some group of soldiers who are special, or just because, well, dang it, Sarge, it works. Those items are always contenders 
for future uniform standards. And here is a reliable prediction about the next big uniform change. It will come like a bolt from the heavens, simply because such changes are so easy to implement. And now it might not be a bad idea to take a look at the Space Force uniform to see how it conforms to these themes and what the future may hold for it.